Hi, everyone, and welcome to our pre-recorded webinar presentation on oral immunotherapy. I am Carrie Mokowski. I'm the National Program Senior Manager here at Bayer. And before I pass this presentation off to our expert speaker, I'd like to introduce him. So with us today, we have Dr. Brian Vickery. Dr. Vickery is an Associate Professor of Pediatrics at Emory University and Director of the Food Allergy Center at Children's Healthcare of Atlanta. For 12 years, he has worked to develop therapies for IgE-mediated food allergy and find evidence-driven treatment strategies that maximize the benefit-risk relationship and improve patient-centered outcomes. Dr. Vickery currently serves as Bayer's Medical Advisor for Patient Experience. Dr. Vickery attended the University of Georgia and the Medical College of Georgia. He completed his residencies at New York Presbyterian Hospital, Wheel Carnell Medical Center, and his fellowship training in allergy and clinical immunology at Yale University School of Medicine, where he worked on a preclinical model of an investigational peanut allergy vaccine. He previously held faculty positions at Duke University of Medicine and the University of North Carolina School of Medicine. At this time, I am delighted to turn the presentation over to Dr. Vickery. Thanks very much, Carrie, for that kind introduction. I want to thank FAIR for putting together this wonderful webinar series, which includes not only this uh, episode, but many previous episodes that have now been archived online in case you've missed them. There's an upcoming Food Allergy 101 episode with Dr. Kristen Sokol on May the 14th. And I think these are great educational initiatives for the community. I also want to thank FAIR for inviting me to present on OIT, which is obviously a very hot topic in the field right now. Um, this, this is a great opportunity to share information with you. Uh, there are many capable speakers that could have been selected, and so it really was an honor for me to be selected. And finally, uh, for those of you listening in uh, now, I want to uh, send my personal best wishes to all of you um, as we go through this COVID-19 crisis together. I hope that each of your families are remaining healthy and, uh, and you're remaining safe and sane. So I've titled my presentation, The Dawn of the Treatment Era in Food Allergy. Uh, and you see here uh, a, a shot of Atlanta uh, early in the morning um, because the sun is rising on a future in food allergy that's going to now involve treatment on a widespread basis. And so this is a really exciting time. And again, I'm, I'm so happy to be with you uh, to share this information during this webinar. Let's start with disclosures and disclosures are important. So um, some listeners may know that uh, several years ago, I took a sabbatical from academia to work for Immune. Uh, and I had a unique opportunity at that time to lead an international phase three trial. So I took that opportunity uh, because it was a, a, a an unprecedented uh, situation uh, where we could generate the data and answer the question definitively uh, whether or not to bring OIT forward to patients at scale uh, based on, you know, the largest trial ever done in, um, in immunotherapy. And so this was an exciting opportunity. I'm, uh, I'm glad I took it. It was a very challenging and rewarding time uh, because I now have a much better sense of what it takes to develop a treatment. But I left Immune and returned to academia in 2018. Uh, I do advise several companies in the space, as, where as, as well as FAIR itself, uh, who is the sponsor of today's talk. Uh, and I think this is important uh, uh, because full disclosure uh, ensures integrity and transparency. I also want to uh, start the talk by acknowledging so many folks who have brought us to this point. A few years ago, uh, Dr. Lack, when he presented the results of the LEAD trial, started his presentation with the acknowledgement slide, which typically goes last uh, at the end of the talk when people are shuffling off to their next appointment or tired and having trouble paying attention. Uh, and he moved his acknowledgements to the front, which is something that I really love and, and, and places that recognition where it belongs front and center. So there's so many shout outs to give here uh, to the entire team at uh, FAIR, past and present every brave individual that participated in the clinical trial or received treatment in clinic, those that sponsor and fund research, all of my many mentors over the years, especially Dr. Burks, uh, my team here in Atlanta, my family, uh, and then certainly those of you who are essential frontline workers and healthcare providers, we owe you a special debt of gratitude right now, and then you, the audience, again, for, for tuning in today. 
So I've chosen to frame the problem in food allergies for this talk in terms of the psychosocial burdens it creates for families. And to me, this is the biggest source of daily suffering related to food allergy. This can be hard to understand by outsiders who aren't living with the food allergy challenges that we see every day. But as clinicians, we, we do see this regularly. And FAIR's work has shown that while over 90% of providers observe this kind of suffering, only 15% of patients are receiving any kind of uh, recognition, treatment, or, uh, or service of any kind to address this. And this represents a huge gap and unmet need in food allergy care. FAIR has also been instrumental in setting a patient-centered research agenda so that we as researchers know what kind of advances would be most meaningful to our patients. You can see at the bottom of the slide here the rank-ordered list of the top five research priorities identified by FAIR's Outcomes Research Advisory Board a few years ago, an initiative that I was proud to be a part of. This provides a useful target to us as researchers to make sure that our uh, uh, discoveries are fulfilling the needs of our patients and provides for us a useful target uh, in developing research projects. And the development of new treatments, which was listed here as the number one research priority by the Outcomes uh, Advisory Board, is why we're here today on this webinar and sort of sets the stage for a discussion about OIT. So over the next hour, my objectives are, one, to provide a general overview of what oral immunotherapy is, how it works, and in whom it might be most useful. I wanna share my perspectives that may help facilitate a conversation with your allergist or your child's allergist and to give some perspectives on where I think the, the field may be going in terms of future directions and research. So I wanna start the talk with some key messages. Uh, these are the, the take home points that I'd like you to walk away from this webinar with and I'll repeat them at the end. The first is that uh, the field is at a very exciting place, um, really at an inflection point with OIT, especially for peanut allergy, really uh, at the cusp of becoming a much more widely available treatment. Secondly, we know from clinical trials and real world experience that OIT can provide high rates of desensitization uh, and a, an amount of improvement that appears to be clinically meaningful for patients. We know that OIT has known risks and trade-offs and certainly is not right for all patients which is the case for every medication. We know that no study has ever convincingly shown that OIT is a curative treatment. And we know that we have much more to learn about how best to implement OIT in routine care, how to build on it and improve it, and how it will fit in a rapidly changing treatment landscape. So let's start with a discussion about what OIT is and what it's not. So at the current time, we can characterize OIT as an emerging treatment option for some allergies, not all, um, either alone in combination. So we, this has been used mostly for peanut, egg, wheat, tree nuts, milk, and sesame. I would say that we, we know the most and have the best data for peanut allergy, uh, and others are relatively understudied. We know that OIT is a process that involves the daily ingestion of relatively small but gradually increasing amounts of allergenic proteins to desensitize the patient and offer protection from accidents. It's important to note that patients on OIT must still practice avoidance, carry epinephrine, and take all current precautions prior to starting OIT. So I refer to this when I speak to patients as uh, an analogy where you know, we, we still have to drive the speed limit, but now we have a seat belt. OIT is associated with known risks, including allergic reactions and anaphylaxis, an allergic condition of the esophagus called eosinophilic esophagitis, which I'll call EOE from here on out, uh, as well as treatment failure or treatment withdrawal. And we'll talk about these things in greater detail later in the presentation. We know that OIT is not available everywhere and not endorsed for widespread clinical use by stakeholder organizations due to limitations in the data. And we also know that it's moving into the realm of mainstream allergy practice soon uh, based on the recent FDA approval of Palforgia for peanut allergy. Now this slide loosely organizes a lot of key events in the history of how we got here, beginning with the initial case report in 1908 uh, of a patient treated in, in England with egg OIT. 
So this is a 100-year-old technology, which is amazing. Then subsequently, uh, Portier and Richet, two French physiologists, won the Nobel Prize in 1913 for their discovery of anaphylaxis, which showed for the first time that the immune response can be harmful. Prior to that, it was thought that the immune response could only be helpful. And then 50 years later, the Ishizakas, a husband and wife team working at Johns Hopkins, discovered IgE, which was a major scientific breakthrough for allergy and showed uh, which parts of the immune system are responsible for causing anaphylaxis. In 1972, Charlie May showed uh, beyond a doubt that food allergy is a real problem. Uh, prior to that, interestingly, many physicians sort of discounted food allergy, uh, but he showed by developing the double-blind placebo-controlled food challenge that food reactions were definitely real and mediated by the immune system. And this uh, opened up uh, research into food allergy, especially by giving us a tool with which to rigorously evaluate it. Interest in treating food allergy uh, soon followed, and the initial approach was to use injections, as has been typical in the treatment of other allergic conditions. There was a trial in the mid-90s, which unfortunately resulted in a death due to an error, where a, a patient in a subcutaneous injection study of peanut extract died after being uh, erroneously administered active treatment when they were in the placebo group. And this really stopped research for a while, um, and, and this, uh, it, this injection approach was obviously abandoned. But it started to pave the way for an oral approach, which was thought possibly to be safer. Then there were two uh, key studies that were published in the mid 90s sorry the mid 2000s uh, first in egg and one and then secondly in peanut by the groups at duke and arkansas and these uh these papers provided key evidence early on in the proof of concept of uh, oral immunotherapy to these two foods now prior to these two studies um going back as far as you can in pubmed there were only 77 oral immunotherapy studies in the literature before that first egg paper. But afterwards, there have been 700 uh, plus publications since then. So a tenfold increase in research productivity after the publication of these two pivotal papers. And this really accelerated and transformed the research landscape. Things really got busy uh, in 2011, where the first randomized controlled trial was published. Uh, FAIR, then called uh, FAI, held a famous research retreat focused on these emerging therapies, uh, asking the question, how can these treatments be made available to many, many patients uh, following rigorous testing? And the company was born out of that meeting to bring this treatment uh, through commercial development. And that initial company was called ARC, but later Immune. It launched a phase three study in 2015, which was very, very quick. And in 2016, uh, a bunch of private practice groups uh, banded together and created an organization called FAST to offer uh, uh, OIT in a network and share best practices. As I mentioned in 2020, and on January 31st, uh, AR101 became the first uh, treatment ever to be approved by any regulatory agency worldwide with the indication of food allergy, which is a major milestone for our community. And this all represents a massive amount of progress in a relatively short period of time. So currently there are two major schools of thought that have emerged in the field. Those that feel that OIT meets FDA's definition of a drug and should be developed according to those standards and regulated. And those that feel that it is a food and does not require such regulation. I refer to these schools of thought as denominations, meaning that we all believe in the same deity, but our sacraments, rituals, and practices may differ. And here are some comparisons of those two approaches, one being FDA approved and the other not being evaluated by the FDA. Doses are precisely manufactured in the FDA approved version, where they're quite variable uh, when foods are used as OIT. Protocols are also quite variable. 
FDA approved OIT has been tested in large randomized trials and no large randomized trials have been performed uh, in uh, non-standardized food OIT. The current treatments that are available with food products are offered by about 250 out of 5,000 allergists in the U.S., whereas uh, the more standardized approach is designed for ease of use and scale so that it could be offered by many more allergists around the country providing access to the treatment. There are differences in the way safety data are collected and shared, uh, in cost, uh, and in the available uh, treatments right now. So currently, uh, only palforzia for peanut allergy is available in an FDA-approved form. Egg and tree nut allergens are currently in development, whereas with food uh, standard OIT, there are many multiple foods uh, available now, uh, some in use in combination. So how does OIT work? This image represents sensitivity thresholds in food allergy. So they're generally low and they're variable. The blue squiggly line represents the threshold, which for most foods is around 100 to 125 milligrams. And this is why avoidance is so hard. Keep in mind, that's about the amount of protein in about one-third of a peanut. So if patients are exposed to amounts that are smaller than that, then they won't have a reaction. But if it's a larger exposure than that, then they may have a reaction and need to use epinephrine, say, and go to the emergency room. What we've learned over time is that by exposing patients to small subthreshold exposures, we can shift the reactivity threshold upwards. And this doesn't cure the patient, but it increases the threshold that's required to cause a reaction, which could provide enhanced safety in the case of an accidental exposure, uh, which is a, a, a change that we refer to as desensitization. This should offer protection uh, to the allergen that's been treated, uh, but not to other unrelated allergens. So for instance, if we treat with peanut, we should have a reduction in peanut sensitivity, but not to unrelated foods like tree nuts or milk or egg. And this should make uh, the need for epinephrine and an ER trip or hospital admission uh, uh, perhaps less through this protection. That's the goal of desensitization therapy. It's important to note that OIT induces many changes in the immune response, and I won't spend much time on that today except to point out that the two main cells in the immune system that seem to be most affected are the mast cells and basophils, as well as the B cells that produce a protective antibody called IgG4. Now, how is OIT administered? This schematic is meant to be a general depiction of how the OIT protocol works in the clinic or research unit. It's important to note that some of the protocol occurs in the clinic, but most of it happens at home. And I'll try to walk you through which parts happen where. Now, this is kind of a trial schematic and may be different in some cases from the real world, but I'll walk you through the, the, the slide. In clinical trials, uh, challenges are typically required at baseline in order to measure the threshold of allergen that causes a reaction. Then participants proceed into the three main phases of OIT, the initial day escalation, which happens in the clinic, then the updosing phase, where patients start on a very small dose and then come back to the unit every two weeks or so to have the dose adjusted as tolerated in about uh, two-week intervals for a period of time until they reach the maintenance dose. Uh, and then the dose is kept constant and not adjusted any further. That maintenance dose then continues for months to years. In clinical trials, participants then come back to the unit during maintenance and have a repeat challenge. And this is a way to measure the threshold after treatment and to compare it to the threshold before treatment and see how it's changed, if at all. And this is how we measure how well these treatments work. These challenges on treatment are meant to simulate an accident as to what might happen if patients were to be accidentally exposed to a food while under treatment. It's important to note that these types of success challenges or, or exit challenges that are done in clinical trials are not likely to happen much in clinical practice. And many, if not most patients, will not require a challenge at, at entry prior to starting therapy, though some will, 
uh, because their diagnosis may be unclear, and we'll talk about that a little bit more later on in the talk. Now, how is OIT administered at home? From the perspective of the home environment, it's important to remember that the vast majority of the doses will be given in the home. And in order to do this, a, a mental shift is, is required. So families upon diagnosis typically rearrange their lives and create strict precautions to keep their children away from the things they're allergic to. And in order to use OIT, you have to achieve a mental shift from th the allergen being a threat to being a daily medicine. There's also a fair amount of work involved in actually delivering the treatment. So first, the, the parent or caregiver needs to determine if the child is well enough to dose because they should not dose at all when they're ill. They then need to prepare the daily dose and administer it uh, always on a full stomach. They should uh, assess for any immediate adverse events, typically looking like an allergic reaction. If it is an allergic reaction, then they need to decide is a rescue medication needed? If so, which one? Then what should I do? Do I need to call the office, go to the emergency room, or call 911? If there are no serious uh, uh, adverse events that occur, then the family needs to ensure that the child is monitored with appropriate post-dosing conditions, meaning no vigorous activity or exercise for two to three hours, and that they have adequate supervision. The experience of taking the dose needs to be recorded uh, into some sort of system to be reported back to the doctor. And this all needs to be repeated every day. Families also need to arrange to take off work and school to attend regular office appointments during the buildup phase as needed and then uh, also during maintenance. And this should be continued uh, for uh, essentially an indefinite period based on the fact that OIT is not a curative treatment. So, what kind of gains can you expect if you stick to this kind of protocol? Well, there have been lots of trials, but the one I'm showing you here is the biggest. The Palisade trial enrolled over 500 patients at 66 sites in 10 countries, which is the largest study in immunotherapy to date for food allergy. The primary outcome is shown in the figure on the left, which is the exit peanut challenge after 12 months of treatment. You don't need to be a statistician to see a significant effect here. Those treated with active treatment, uh, the majority were able to tolerate 600 milligrams of peanut protein without symptoms at the end of a year of treatment, or about two whole peanuts, and 50% tolerated the 1,000 milligram dose, or closer to four peanuts, which was the highest dose tested in this study. It's also important to look at the improvement made by individuals who completed the protocol on the right side of the slide to see how they did from the beginning of the study to the end. And what you can see is on average, there was a hundredfold improvement in their threshold from the beginning of the study to the end of the study. And this is what we mean when we say desensitization. There are also other benefits of OIT, including the familiarity of the concept. This is an easy to understand treatment that you can explain to a grade school child who will get the, the concept of taking small doses to build strength in your immune system and to become more tolerant of the food. It's easy to administer in about five minutes, and we hear from parents that it's reassuring to be able to see that daily dose is taken and tolerated. And there is substantial clinical experience involving patients all around the world uh, and trial data that are reproducible, giving us confidence that the treatment works as we understand it. There is also a sense of empowerment with OIT, taking action to treat the, the problem actively rather than continuing avoidance, and to do things that facilitate more normal activities that might be difficult during a period of avoidance. We know that many families um, abstain from normal activities like parties or travel because of food allergy, and this treatment helps a kid just be a kid. Also, the regular engagement with the OIT team and other families undergoing treatment provided support and empowerment throughout the process because there are many visits that are required, and this allows uh, uh, many questions to be answered and knowledge to be gained, and families typically report 
satisfaction with growing in their their sense of mastery of the OIT concepts and, and food allergy concepts and becoming more educated and empowered along the way. We also know, of course, that desensitization acts as an insurance policy against accidents because mistakes will inevitably happen no matter how careful families are at avoiding foods, and the desensitization provides an additional margin of safety. This does result in improved quality of life in most studies, but the effects are complex, um, and it should be noted that some patients and families do get worse uh, in quality of life, uh, sometimes temporarily, sometimes apparently uh, for a longer period of time. But ultimately, we need better tools to understand this because the quality of life instruments that we have were not intended to measure the effect of a treatment. And um, we use them in that context because they're the best that we have, but we do need better tools that go beyond just quality of life to include patient-reported outcomes like how much the treatment is valued, the costs or trade-offs of the treatment, the burdens that are required, and so on. Now, one key point I want to get across is that there's no evidence that OIT can cure patients. This slide highlights that the studies shown on the slide have all taken patients off of OIT follows, following successful desensitization and then brought them back to the research unit after a period of time and repeated their food challenges. And what this figure shows is that the longer you wait, the more reactive you'll be in the follow-up food challenge. So the desensitization effect wears off when you stop treatment. In some studies, in as little as one week. So the allergy is always there in the background, and it'll rear its head again if you were to stop taking doses for any period of time. But you may be thinking right now, hold on a second. I've read news reports of cures really from all over the world. And I've even read stuff online and via social media about how office-based OIT can cure allergies. And so what I would say is, Anytime you're doing homework on a health condition, critically analyze everything you read. This is especially true in situations like OIT, where you have a hot topic attracting lots of attention and lots of folks in need of hope and help. I would recommend that you follow Dr. Dave's three helpful steps that you see here on the screen. And if you're on Twitter, you can follow Dr. Dave there too. I want to send a shout out to Dave. Thanks. You're a superhero for your efforts to, to provide evidence-based education to the public and to fight misinformation. Here's another key message for today. OIT has a known set of risks that have been repeatedly seen in nearly every study. First, most patients experience adverse events during OIT, which typically involve the GI tract, scan, and respiratory symptoms. Now, most of these are mild to moderate and manageable, but they can be severe, and this is typically unpredictable. Anaphylaxis has been reported to occur in 15 to 20 percent of patients on OIT or perhaps more. And EOE, as we mentioned, has been estimated to occur in 2 to 5 percent, but this is likely an underestimate. Symptoms are intolerable for 10 to 20 percent or so of patients who must withdraw from therapy. This is usually related to GI symptoms and occurs typically within the first six to eight weeks of treatment. It's important to recognize the known risks of augmentation or cofactors, and that these can occur even in maintenance. These factors shown here on the screen are known to affect thresholds and severity of reaction and act as warnings about dosing. And I'll talk a little bit more about these in detail on a later slide. And lastly, it's my belief that dose may be important because early on, in OIT research, there was a belief that perhaps high-dose therapy would be more likely to lead to true tolerance or cure, but there's no evidence that that actually happens. And in fact, there is evidence that high-dose treatment could potentially cause more adverse events. So it's intuitive that more might be better, but we're not, we're, we're not really sure that that's the case based on the data we have. So I want to talk about these two main risks in more detail in the next couple of slides. The mechanism of EOE makes sense in the context of OIT because it occurs through the process of regularly swallowing allergens. The estimates of new onset OIT diagnosed, uh, sorry, new, new onset EOE diagnosed during OIT ranges from between 2 and 5%, but this is probably an underestimate. 
And this is because we mostly just stop it rather than scope, and nobody is scoped at the beginning. As a result, cause and effect is not really well established, so we don't really understand the relationship between these two conditions. Some groups have tried to treat through it by reducing dose, and this has been successful in some observational studies. But I think you should discuss with your doctor how you will handle GI events. And if you or your child already have EOE, be very careful. I personally would not routinely start OIT in such a patient. And please note that it's contraindicated on the palforzia label. Now, with respect to allergic reactions in anaphylaxis, there's some evidence that the dosing regimen itself could play a role. With high-dose OIT shown at the top of the screen in a private practice group using a dose of 2,000 milligrams per day, overall 42% of the population stopped transfer care or were lost to follow-up, and 23% required epinephrine, even uh, five years or more into maintenance. 13.7% developed EOE or something like it. But on the other hand, with very slow updosing that took over a year to accomplish and a target maintenance dose of 125 milligrams or 16 times less than in the previously mentioned study, three quarters of patients were still desensitized and there were no differences in withdrawal rates or serious events between active and placebo. There was no epinephrine use related to OIT and no EOE in this study. So the same treatment looks totally different safety-wise with different dosing regimens. And that means we really need to figure out the best regimen through the kinds of studies where we randomly assign patients to different doses in the same study. And surprisingly, this hasn't really been done yet. There's also evidence that key environmental factors could play a role in allergic reactions and anaphylaxis. On this slide, you see a Swiss cheese model of risk where when multiple factors line up, you get bad outcomes. And these types of models are used in risk management in all kinds of different industries. What I'm showing you here is how these risks multiply to affect patient thresholds and the severity of their allergic reactions. You'll notice that most of these cofactors shown in the red box are environmental in nature and therefore should be manageable or avoidable. Things like medications you may be taking, other conditions like asthma, fever, and so on. And this emphasizes the importance of following dosing instructions. We need to understand these cofactors much better in the real world outside of clinical trials. There's much more left to be learned about them. So moving on, is OIT right for our family? Let's talk about some considerations. There are five key questions you should ask. The first is, is the diagnosis correct? We know we have a high false positive rate in food allergy. And some patients may need an oral challenge first. I'll talk a little bit more about this in subsequent slides. Second, are there any other allergic diseases and how well controlled are they? Confirmed or suspected EOE should be disqualifying, as well as severe or poorly controlled asthma. Even mild asthma or eczema can flare and should be optimally managed. And allergic rhinitis may be a risk factor has been shown to be a safety risk factor in at least one study, and starting injections may be difficult once you start OIT. So we want to optimize control of these conditions before starting OIT, and frequently we do take some time before starting and add or adjust medications like those for asthma to ensure OIT goes as smoothly as possible. Another question is, do we have the time? Can we make the lifestyle adjustments? You've seen on previous slides what it takes to do OIT, and it's important to be honest with yourself about whether you're really ready to fully embrace the required commitments. It should be noted that lots of folks have been able to successfully do it, thousands of families, but your mileage may vary here depending on things like extracurricular activities, job or travel demands, and so on. Next, are our, expect are our expectations realistic, and are they in tune with our child's desires? Remember, this is not a curative treatment, which means you need to have a sustainable long-term plan for continuing it. This is not gonna be over in six months. And you need to have realistic expectations about the risk of allergic symptoms and the need possibly to give epinephrine if need be. Finally, how comfortable are we with the practice environment? 
there's a lot that goes into the practice side of OIT, and you want to be sure that you're comfortable with how the practice operates and what your treatment plan looks like. You want to make sure you'll have the support and communication you need. The practice should answer your questions fully about how they do OIT and what you can expect, and you should gain confidence that they're skilled at it. This is a bit like interviewing a surgeon or someone else who does potentially risky procedures. You may want to get more than one opinion. Now I want to spend a minute on the importance of a good evaluation prior to starting OIT. This is because many, many patients are unnecessarily avoiding foods to which they're not actually allergic, just based on a positive test result. So if we think about selecting patients for OIT, the two main goals of this selection would be to identify good candidates while minimizing dependence on OFCs or food challenges. In this evaluation, the history of reaction to the allergenic food is critical. Let's consider three scenarios. The first is a recent history with unequivocal objective signs of anaphylaxis. The second patient has a distant history of objective allergic reactions. Say, a 13-year-old who experienced hives on the face and an itchy red rash on the body when exposed to peanuts at 18 months of age. The third is a patient with either no history, no exposure that produced any signs of symptoms, or maybe a vague history where there was an unwitnessed uh, ingestion while they were in the care at, at, at school or daycare, and it's not really clear what happened next. In the first scenario, essentially any positive test, a skin test, a specific IgE or a component test is essentially diagnostic, and these individuals could be considered candidates for therapy without having to undergo challenge. But be aware that a uh, history of severe or life-threatening anaphylaxis as a warning to treatment, uh, as well as severe poorly controlled asthma or eosinophilic GI disorders like we've mentioned before. In the other scenarios, further evaluation would be warranted before determining whether therapy can be recommended. And in this situation, a reliable bar biomarker that accurately predicted allergy would be immensely helpful for the field, and that's something we don't yet have. Now, as a medical student in Augusta, Georgia, I was taught treat the patient, not just the number. In other words, the lab value is one piece of data but must be synthesized with other clinical findings. This simple exercise illustrates how the same lab value can mean three completely different things in, in different patients. So consider a peanut-specific IgE of five kilounits per liter. In the first patient, this patient is actually allergic to shrimp, but the pediatrician, when evaluating the allergy, sent a food panel and detected a peanut-specific IgE of less than of five in a patient who eats peanut butter all the time and loves it. In that case, that's clearly a false positive result, and allergy to peanut is unlikely. In the second situation, a young child with eczema seems to have that eczema flare after eating peanut, eating peanut products, but doesn't clearly have an allergic reaction that involves hives or vomiting or anaphylaxis. And in that case, this peanut IgE may be meaningful or it may not be. And in the third case, a clear allergic reaction commenced within minutes after eating a small amount of peanut. And the same lab value means peanut allergy is very, very likely. So it depends critically on the history how we interpret the same lab value in different circumstances. Now, it'd be ideal if we could also do a test to tell us who's going to do well on OIT and who's going to do poorly and might actually skip it. We might be able to also tell this from other patient factors, such as asthma or other medical risk factors. This slide is an early attempt to organize what we know about who may have more trouble than others on the left-hand side of the figure and who may do better on the right-hand side of the figure. But it should be noted that these are very weak associations based on early poor quality data from small observations. We'll learn much more about this very soon once we've treated thousands or tens of thousands of patients in the real world. And guidance about patient selection is gonna be increasingly available from key organizations like FAIR, who you may have heard convened an OIT summit last fall in which I participated along with other leaders in the field. There's a paper coming out soon from that summit. As always, speak to your doctor. Specialty societies are developing aids to help determine whether or not a treatment is right for you, like this shared decision-making tool from the American College 
the American College of Allergy that's available at the link shown on the slide. In the last few minutes, I want to spend a, few a little bit of time imagining where the field is going. Make no mistake, we want to cure this disease, but we're not quite there yet. More realistically, in the short term, once the virus dies down some, there'll be three major impacts. The first is we'll be changing the way our practices operate to offer access to OIT to many more people. This is not simply like a new small molecule drug, like an antibiotic or a blood pressure medication where we can just write the prescription and move on. We have to really change the way we practice allergy care. The second is we need to figure out how to optimize these treatments, compare them to one another, and figure out what they really offer in terms of value and cost effectiveness. And thirdly, we need to continue to work on a cure. This is a super exciting time to be working in allergy and in translational medicine in general, given the parallel explosions also happening in access to data and computing power, and the emergence of major research networks in allergy and food allergy in particular. Now this slide is meant to give you a flavor of how deep the pipeline is in food allergy. As a result of the successes to date and the rapid pace of research I already showed you, there's been an explosion of research activity in the field. It's really exciting nowadays as a researcher to go to meetings and conferences and discuss the projects that are being developed. Here I'm showing you 24 programs that are either active in green or have been publicly announced but not launched yet in gray, and I'm sure there are others that have not yet been announced. I don't show you all of these and to go through them all and to give you a sense of all the different types of approaches that are being considered, but just to give you a sense of how deep and wide the pipeline is. Now, some of these projects build on what we already know, like applying the same approach to a new food or a new age group or testing a combination of drugs. And some are quite innovative, studying entirely new approaches. The ones in the former group are much closer to getting ready for clinical use, whereas the latter will still require a good bit more study. Keep in mind that the development of new treatments takes lots of time and money, and most fail somewhere along the way. The current success rate is estimated to be about 12%, which means that for every eight molecules that starts development, one succeeds which means that we may expect about three of the approaches on the previous page to ultimately make it to the clinic. Of these approaches, the most likely, in my opinion, to move forward the quickest is a strategy called Allergen Plus, where we combine OIT with a biologic. In blue, you can see the effects that immunotherapy has on the, on the system, as well as the current treatments we use to treat reactions. And this is well downstream of the allergic inflammation that's happening that causes food allergy. But now in the red boxes, we have the ability to target specific molecules and other components of the immune response to block more effectively the allergic inflammation before it results in the generation of IgE antibodies or inflammation. And there are several trials that are testing these approaches now, which might, through their uh, targeting of specific parts of the immune system disable them and make OIT safer or easier to use or more permanent or some, in some way more effective. But to get where we need to go, we need to tackle at least five hard questions. The first is how do patients and families define success? What are their goals and what are they willing to give to achieve these goals? Are they looking for bite proof protection, high threshold protection or more like free eating, remission, or actual cure for the disease to go away. Secondly, is that really aligned with what doctors and researchers say that they want? How can we measure these outcomes prioritized by both doctors and patients in a rigorous and standardized way equally across studies? What is it that these treatments really offer in terms of the degree of protection, the duration of protection, whether the protection is food specific or more non-specific or generalized? And what is the long-term viability of treatments that must be continued indefinitely? For whom is the risk benefit equation acceptable? For some patients, it's not likely to be acceptable with certain treatments and for others it might be. And they may be better, the first group of patients may be candidates for a different type of treatment. And how do we assess 
that risk benefit equation for different patients. Will treatment be cost effective and how do we define value in the field? Once we have better answers to these questions, we can start to identify which treatment, if any treatment at all, is best for which patient. And so as food allergy matures into a field where there are multiple potential treatments, and really there already are now considering the differences in the clinics offering OIT, things will start to seem increasingly confusing. Just like Calvin, my favorite six-year-old philosopher explains here. But we can't just throw up our hands like he does. I'm especially interested in figuring out ways to help families navigate these dilemmas. And we must always remember as we tackle these unknowns that there exists a hierarchy of data quality. A doctor reporting the experience of a few patients is not the same thing as a randomized trial or a meta-analysis of all randomized trials. And likewise, anecdotes from YouTube or social media or other sources are not data. So what can we look forward to over the coming decade? Here are some of my predictions. First, I think we'll see widespread utilization of real-world OIT with cuff and also other non-FDA-approved food-based approaches. We'll start to see improvements and alignment in the way we measure outcomes, in the way we provide doses, in the way we select patients, and in the biomarkers we use to guide therapy. I think it's likely that we'll see additional approvals by the FDA and the European medicines agencies uh, for standardized products with both new products for peanut and new age groups for those products, as well as other allergens like egg, tree nuts, milk, and perhaps multi-allergen approaches, which are increasingly being studied since we know that 30 to 40% of patients are allergic to multiple foods. I think we'll see continued development and uh, moving into clinical use of these allergen plus strategies, uh, coupling OIT with the biologic, like I showed you before. And I think we'll see more innovative uh, early stage therapeutic strategies moving into late stage development. On average, it takes about 10 years to move through the process. So over the next decade, I think we'll start to see both specific and non-specific approaches that are in early stage research now moving closer towards being available towards uh, clinical use in patients. Here's where we are now at sort of version 1.0 of immunotherapy, where we use dosing strategies that are not rigorously worked out, but based on educated guesses. We measure uh, endpoints, see how well these treatments work using sort of poorly defined tools. We don't really know who the treatments work best in, so we treat all comers, and this leads to heterogeneity in the outcome. And we haven't really prioritized patient voices in all these outcomes that we measure. But I'd like to see us move towards a 2.0 version of immunotherapy, where we have rational dosing strategies that are based on evidence and driven by biology. By analogy here, I might think about the way immunotherapy is delivered in cancer, where uh, the tumor that is removed from a patient undergoes genetic sequencing. And based on the expression of certain markers, the treatment is customized uh, for that patient based on their biology. And I think that's, that's where I'd like to see us go in food allergy, where we're measuring clear reproducible endpoints, we're precisely selecting patients based on their likelihood of response on their biology, and we're including their voices in how we measure whether or not the treatments are effective. Here are the key messages I started with. And I want to end by concluding that, you know, as I mentioned, we're now just the dawn of the treatment area in food allergy. The sun is coming up. The, day, the whole day is in front of us, and the future is bright. I want to thank you all for your time today, and I wish that you and your families remain healthy and well during the COVID-19 crisis. Things will get better, and we look forward to seeing you all again in clinic when we can. Until then, be safe and be kind to one another. And please, before we go, consider registering for the, pair, the FAIR Patient Registry, which is an easy way for you to help us advance food allergy care by giving researchers the power to answer critical questions that we need answers to. Right now, we have over 10,000 unique entries. Please consider telling your story. Carrie, back to you. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Vickery. Um, I would just like to say on behalf of the food allergy community, a huge thank you for sharing your time with us, your expertise, and your experience in the field. I mean, like you said, it is a hot topic, it's an important topic, and it's of great interest. And I think you've really given families a solid foundation of information to work with, and then a pretty uh, fascinating glimpse into the future and what that could look like. And I mean, as you know, and we, we hear it often here at FAIR, I'm sure you do in your practice, the consideration of OIT as a treatment option, it's not necessarily a, a no-brainer, quote-unquote. So I know everyone who watches will find value in this presentation. So I can't thank you enough. So um, we loved having you and, and hope you come back again. And thanks again for joining us. Well, thanks very much for the opportunity. It really was a pleasure. Uh, and I look forward to connecting with you again soon.